G'day Internet, my name is Jason Sabalo and this is a Catholic Social Democrats vlog. If this is your first time at my channel, welcome, or if you've been here before, welcome back. Today is Wednesday and on my channel I want to make Wednesday Art and Culture Wednesday. So, you know, every Wednesday I'm going to try and put out a video that talks about something artistic or cultural. So for our first Art and Culture Wednesday, I'm going to talk about an opera production that I went to last week. Yes, last week I travelled down to Sydney and I went to probably my nation's most iconic, iconic building, the Sydney Opera House, and I saw a production of the opera Orpheus and Eurydice put on by Opera Australia, which is Australia's main opera company. So Orpheus and Eurydice is an opera by the composer Christoph Willibald Gluck. And Gluck was a composer of the early classical period. He was born in what is now Germany and raised in what is now the Czech Republic. Now Orpheus and Eurydice first premiered in, six, in, sorry, in 1762. And it was the first of what Gluck called his, his reform operas. Now, what does he mean by that? that? At the time Gluck was writing, he saw that serious opera had become, you know, very elaborate, that it had very grandiose music, and the complexity of the music, in Gluck's view, got in the way of the storytelling, which he saw as fundamental to opera. So he wanted to restore what he called a noble simplicity to opera, and he had the view that very much the music was there to tell the story, and that the beauty of the music should be subordinate to the telling of the story, that fundamentally for him opera is a storytelling art, and if the elaborateness of the music gets in the way of telling that story, you're doing it wrong. So he came up with this concept of the reform opera and noble simplicity, and he made a big deal of that, and Orpheus and Eurydice was the first of his reform operas. Now, to give you a bit of an idea of what it's about, I'm, I'm assuming most of you know the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus was a very talented musician. He was the son, in most versions of the legend, of the god Apollo. He was married to Eurydice and he deeply loved her, but she died. In most versions of legend, she died as a result of a snake bite. And Orpheus descends into the underworld and is told, basically, you can take your wife back to the land of the living, but you have to walk ahead of her and you can't look back to see if she's really there and if you look back at any point, she will have to return to the land of the dead. And, of course, in the legend, Orpheus, just as he gets to the land of the living, he does, in fact, look back, and Eurydice returns to the world of the dead. However, in Gluck's version, all of that happens, but... and. Orpheus is so sad at having lost Eurydice again that he's talking about killing himself and weeping so deeply over his lost love. But in Gluck's version, Eurydice is restored to him because he is told that he loves her so much that the greatness of his love has restored Eurydice to him even though he broke the rules and looked back. And you know, he leads Eurydice back into the land of the living and they live happily ever after, and everything is great. So Gluck departed quite substantially at the end there from the original myth. Now, it's a fairly simple and straightforward opera. There are only three characters that are actually sung by solo voices. There's a chorus and a number of, of characters that are portrayed by that chorus, but there are only three characters in the opera who get their own individual singers. One of those is obviously Orpheus, the other is Eurydice, and the third is a character who is simply named Love, who is you know, an embodiment of, or perhaps a goddess of love. You could identify her with Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, although that isn't explicit in the text. But those are the only three parts in, in the opera. And this, production took 
what I thought was a somewhat radical decision to have the same soprano sing both the part of Eurydice and the part of love. Now, that it sometimes made it a little bit confusing. There's a bit at the end where love is singing about Eurydice being restored and then straight away Eurydice is restored and it's a little hard to follow, hang on, which character is she playing there? But I think it actually worked and I want to give big props to Kathy D. Zhang. Um, she was the soprano who played both Eurydice and love and she gave a great performance. I really admired her. She was probably the best thing about this performance. Other really good things about the performance, the orchestra and the music. It has to be said, Gluck wrote beautiful music for the opera, and, yeah, it was a joy to listen to. I have to be a bit honest. Um, I'm a big Wagner fan. My personal tastes in operatic music, I tend to like what I guess you'd call the romantic style in music. Gluck was very much a product of the classical period, so the music is perhaps not as much to my taste as an opera of, say, Wagner or Verdi, but there's no doubt it was very beautiful and the Opera Australia Orchestra played really well. So the two, the big things that I loved about this production were Kathy D. Zhang's performance and the Opera Australia Orchestra and the music. That was all great. Now, the, the singer who played Orpheus, it's important to understand that when Gluck wrote this part, it was common for male parts in operas to be sung by castrati by people who well been castrated who had therefore not gone through you know proper biological puberty and therefore had voices that for men were what we might think of as unnaturally high now thankfully we live in more civilized ages and we don't do that to men anymore but the part of Orpheus was written for a castrato. Um, so in, in the modern world, that part is generally sung by a countertenor. Now, for those who aren't sure, a countertenor is the highest type of male voice, and they get up to a pitch that generally only female singers can get up to. And... In this case, the part of Orpheus was sung by a countertenor named Christophe Dumont. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. I will put the spelling of his name on the screen so you can check, but I, I think it's Dumont. I, I'm really not sure. He's a French countertenor. I did some Googling about him. He is very well regarded, and I think he gave a good performance. But I have to be honest, that very high-pitched male voice doesn't really fit with my own personal aesthetic preferences. That's no criticism of him. I think he did a great job. But it, it sounds a bit weird for a character who is supposed to be the hero to have such a high voice, or at least it sounds that, that way to me. It's my personal aesthetic preferences, you know, I, you may disagree, uh, I can understand. Um, sorry. So I have a big criticism of the production, actually a couple of big criticisms of the production. The first is they use circus acrobats and they had acrobats from an Australian circus on stage performing acrobatic stunts throughout the performance. And I was aware of this. It was advertised on the Opera Australia website that they were having these acrobats. And I went in quite excited to see how they were going to integrate the acrobats into the telling of the story and how they were going to use the acrobats to tell or, or you know, um, elucidate the story. And it kind of turned out that they didn't. You know, all through the production, you had these acrobats performing what were very impressive feats of acrobatics. But I was sitting there thinking, OK, but what has this got to do with the story you're telling? I, I couldn't actually see anything about what the acrobats were doing that, you know, in any way made clear or added anything to the storytelling. And given that Gluck was such a big believer 
in subordinating everything to the story and making the music tell the story, this seems to be a very weird opera to do that with, and it seems to be not really consistent with Gluck's principles. And I have to say, if, if I'd been at the circus, then I'd seen the acrobats performing those stunts, I would have been very impressed. But in the concept, context of the opera, I just found them distracting and thinking, okay, what, what's going on here? I'm trying to follow what this person is singing. Um, and yeah, it was a just big distraction. The other thing that, uh, obviously the opera was in Italian and I don't speak Italian, and is, as is generally the case with Opera Australia production, they had surtitles, which are like subtitles, but up top rather than down below, translating what was being sung into English, and that's normal, and, and I had no problem following what was going on. But then there was a period of about 15 minutes um, early in the third act where the, sub, the surtitles stopped and they weren't put up there. And I had no idea what <coughs> the characters were singing. And this was during a really important bit. This was actually during the bit, I think, when Orpheus looked back and, you know, when he wasn't supposed to look back and thought Eurydice was lost. And I don't know, was it a creative decision to not have surtitles for this 15-minute period or was it there, you know, there were supposed to be surtitles, but there was a technical mess up and they didn't show up. If it was an artistic decision to not have surtitles during that crucial point, I have to say it was a bad artistic decision. Um, it really made it hard for me to follow the story and work out what was going on. And what would have been a really emotional part of the opera was kind of lost the context to me because I didn't understand what they were singing. If it was a technical mess up, well, okay, I understand technical faults happen. You know, they sometimes can't be avoided, but it unfortunately did have the effect of making the production harder to follow for me. So on the whole, yeah, the orchestra, it was beautiful music. The orchestra gave a great performance. Kathy D. Zang gave a great performance. I presume Christophe Demo gave a great performance, but as I said, that wasn't really to my taste. I'm glad I saw it, but I'm pretty sure that Opera Australia is going to do better productions this year. So if you're thinking of seeing it, there are three more performances of the production before it ends in a week's time. So it was cool. I'm glad I went to it. But if you're thinking, put it this way, if you're only going to see one Opera Australia production this year, I wouldn't honestly recommend making it this one because, as I said, I'm pretty sure Opera Australia is going to do better productions this year. But it was fun. I can't say I, was, I wasn't glad I said. Having said all that, I seem to be in the minority by being a bit disappointed. Most of the audience around me when the opera ended were clapping really enthusiastic. There were screams of bravo, every, you know, and judging from you know, snippets of conversation that I heard from fellow patrons after the opera, most of the people who were there seemed to enjoy it more than I did. So, you know, my position may be the minority report, but there you go. So thank you for listening to my opinions. I, um, If you've listened all the way through, I appreciate you listening. Please give the video a like if you've enjoyed what I had to say. If you'd like more content from me, click the subscribe button. And if you want to leave a comment down below, uh, I find comments are helpful to me. Please pray for me. Pray for the success of my channel. I promise I will pray regularly for all my channel's viewers. Uh, thank you very much and God bless.